My name is Chris Santiago, and I lead our solutions engineering group here at Unravel Data. For those that don't know Unravel Data, we are a data ops and FinOps observability platform built for modern data stacks like Databricks. Today's topic, right-sizing your data infrastructure, optimizing Databricks cluster and workspace configurations. We're gonna spend the next few minutes together and uh, what you'll get out of this, I'll be walking you guys through how customers are right-sizing their environment today with out-of-the-box tools. Then we're going to understand how life could be better by right-sizing your data infrastructure with Unravel. Then we're going to go and take some questions, and then we'll break for the day. So let's talk about how customers are right-sizing their uh, environments today. If you've been following my webinar series here or my demo series here, uh, I've been talking a lot about Databricks system tables. And the reason why I'm doing this is because it is uh, a great new uh, feature that Databricks have put out uh, not too long ago that provides a rich set of data for folks to really understand what's going on behind the covers of, of Databricks. Uh, but to really understand uh, system tables we kind of need to talk about what life was like even before this. So, um, you know, I have a number of uh, folks that uh, come from the Databricks space and their field team members uh, struggled to, to provide basic observability use cases for their customers. The way that they would have done it before was they would go ahead and connect to various APIs, whether it's internal APIs, external APIs, uh, look at logs, take as much information as they could and put it in a data model that made sense to run analysis through notebooks. And so if we fast forward to today, the product team had taken all the great work that the field team had done with this approach and they put it into the Unity catalog in the form of system tables. Now they did this because they wanted a way to take all this rich data from all the various sources um, such as the APIs and logs and, and whatnot. And they correlated all this information into that system table format. And they uh, released or unleashed uh, folks to just use SQL, which is the universal language that a uh, majority of folks use to be able to go ahead and provide their analysis uh, from that standpoint. And so uh, what Databricks had also done too is um, with the system tables approach, they also introduced bringing in some of the billing information. So bringing in some of those cost metrics. And so that's one of the newer things that they did with the system tables. Um, and so uh, today we are talking about right-sizing your, your infrastructure. And so I thought what would be good is actually just let's, let's actually click on this Databricks link here and see what the community uh, provides as best practices from an optimization standpoint. Now, if I go ahead and scroll down here, um, we can see that the, the topic here is top 10 queries to use with system tables. Well, what are those queries? Let's go ahead and dig in here. So I'm going to go ahead and click on, uh, maybe we'll do this uh, query three here first. So when would increasing t-shirt size for a warehouse lead to better performance? And so if we take this particular use case, um, in order for us to provide uh, t-shirt sizes, we need to know if the actual resources that are being used are are actually um, enough. One way to figure this out is looking for disk spill. And so if you actually, you can read what this is for kind of more like the root cause, um, but then we can see what that query is, right? So here we've got some a select statement here from this query history table, and you got some more information here, and then now you have an output here. And so if you see the sample output here, you could see that, hey, workspace uh, warehouse here uh, has a lot of spilled bytes here. So this could be a candidate. So what we've walked through here is identifying or first understanding, hey, what you would be looking for, right? So disk bill is one way that we can start looking for from a uh, sizing perspective. And then from there, um, uh, somebody who knows uh, how you know what to look for in system tables, go ahead, went ahead and created this query. And then from this output, this gives us some more clues. So this is a warehouse where we want to be able to go ahead and increase that t-shirt size. Now, what that t-shirt size may be, 
let's go ahead and, you know, uh, maybe test some stuff out, maybe bring it up to the next size. Um, you know, I'm not really sure which one it is, but this build tells me maybe more memory. So maybe we'll go and uh, up the memory. And so uh, I would imagine somebody who would be using this would go ahead and um, apply that recommendation, test it out, and maybe look at the system tables again and rinse and repeat. Um, there's some other ones here from uh, from a cost perspective. Uh, what is the daily spend on data, you know, different Databricks products? So you can see very similar thing, right? Somebody knows where to find that information um, and then go ahead and create the query. So this could be a good FinOps uh, use case from that standpoint. Um, this is a very good uh, list here. Uh, uh, feel free to uh, take this uh, link um, or Google search it if you'd like. Um, th there's a couple of things too that are unspoken here um, that I do want to call out. So uh, you do require somebody who knows what they're looking for, knows what they're doing, basically a subject matter expert to kind of understand what are we trying to do and make sense of this data? So that is on you uh, if, if you are using the system tables approach to make sure that somebody is uh, knows what they're doing to be able to create these, uh, you know, actually create some actionable insights from here. Um, you also need to create your own dashboards. You know, by the way, you got to do this also for your various personas, right? So that first use case of teacher sizing, well, this would be good for a technical audience. So somebody who knows and can make the connection of spilled bytes uh, can go ahead and see this. Now, it doesn't tell me exactly what that t-shirt size is, but you know, if I'm going to create some visuals, some dashboard, some sort of report, um, you know, that's not going to be akin to maybe that FinOps user who's going to really care more about uh, the cost of the house because maybe they have a budget to adhere to or maybe they're doing some sort of trend analysis and they want to see that. So a dashboard needs to be created for that. And same thing, subject matter expert needs to kind of know these nuances, create the dashboards from that perspective. Um, you know, probably the bigger statement here too is a lot of this stuff is still uh, requires manual analysis. So someone needs to come in here, know what they're looking at, create those dashboards. Um, if you're trying to do this at scale, maybe we try to, or we want to identify inefficiencies across all of my queries, my workspaces, my jobs, you're not going to get that uh, out of the box. And there, all of that still will require manual analysis from that standpoint. So in a nutshell, uh, the Databricks system tables are a great way for us to use for optimization use cases, but it's um, but a lot of the stuff is a turnkey and there's still a lot of manual effort to set up, install, uh, configure, to start really getting some actionable insights with the system tables approach. Now what I'm gonna do is show you what life could be like if we're gonna do those same exact use cases from Unravel. And so here we are in my playground Databricks environment here. Um, we'll start here on the homepage. Now, um, a couple of things you see here, you see some cost rating here. We're gonna come and circle back to this. You can see some annualized costs. You can see some savings. Uh, you can see some overall stats about like trends from a cost perspective. You know, these dashboards are, are already work out of the box. So no additional configuration. <clears throat> this stuff just starts working. Now we are talking about optimization. So if we go into this top X over here, uh, what you're noticing or what you see here is a report which shows basically a top X of um, things such as most savings, most expensive, longest running, most wasted, most underutilized. Now, if you're like most organizations right now, you're probably doing some sort of top K on the most expensive. And I'm going to go ahead and click on this. And we see some three panels here. So we see most expensive clusters on all purpose compute. Uh, most expensive users of all-purpose compute, most expensive jobs on jobs compute. So we're starting to get some analysis there. Now, one thing I'd like to challenge uh, folks that go down to this model is that um, uh, making the assumption that the most expensive cluster has the most impact from an inefficiency standpoint, uh, you might be right, but that's not always the case. Um, I've worked with organizations that have long streaming clusters. And so by nature, it will just be running and uh, it doesn't mean that it's inefficient. It ends up being maybe one of the more expensive clusters, but maybe that's not where we should be spending our time. Now, to kind of break this down a little bit further, let's actually look in on one of these clusters. 
So we're looking at this, uh, this first cluster here. We can see that this cluster uh, overall has a cost of $17.65. And we can see that Unravel is projecting that we could actually unlock uh, $6.36, basically 36% of spend um, by looking at Unravel's analysis. Now, for the folks that have been following this webinar, you kind of know where my next talk track is going, but I'll assume that some of the newer audiences here are probably understand want to understand how are you getting this 36%. Well, one way I can do this is by going and clicking on this cluster name, which happens to be the user. And from here, it takes us conveniently to this compute tab. And so we're uh, looking at that cluster, what was selected before. And if I go ahead and just click on the spark button and actually just go ahead and expand this, this analysis tab is Unravel's purpose-built AI doing that mean time to identify. So say, hey, is there some inefficiency here? And Unravel does find something here. And we provide very crisp recommendations in this particular one where we're saying, hey, change the node type for the driver and the worker. And by doing so, you can save 17% on the driver node. And um, this worker node here, we can save 40%. So we're starting to see that we're getting that crisp recommendation. If I zoom back out and go back to that top X here, let's go back to most expensive. Um, what you're seeing here is that mean time to identify. Uh, we're also doing some projection in terms of if you make that one change, which we basically just told you, you can go ahead and net out that additional 36% of savings. Um, what you're, what's not spoken here though, is Unravel has already accelerated the process here because mean time to identify goes to zero because we go and we tell you that. Uh, root cause goes to zero because we've done the analysis for you. Uh, and actually fixing and verifying, Unravel has already done the scenario-based analysis. So we're giving you a very good uh, recommendation here to save costs uh, without uh, effective performance and stability. Um, and so all you need to do is actually make this recommendation. Now think about the different other audiences too. So maybe a technical audience, uh, maybe uh, want, would want to get a little bit more details and we have uh, reports and dashboards to give you the uh, the details as to why we made those recommendations. But think about those FinOps teams, the ones that are trying to optimize their environment, but they don't know the technical jargon on how to speak to a Databricks team that's using Databricks for some Gen AI workload. Uh, what this does, it allows them to have that conversation to say, hey, look, Unravel is actually saying we could save 36% in this particular case. So why don't you go and click on this URL and make those changes? It makes the conversation a lot easier. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about this most expensive cluster too, is that when you think about uh, most expensive, um, you know, we, I've made that statement, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that's where most of the savings are, but hey, we have a most savings metric here. And if we actually click on that, we can see some you know, different metrics, right? So we could see it ends up actually being this cluster is happens to be the most expensive, but also has the most savings, but that's not always the case. And so think about folks that are trying to operationalize this. What we want to be able to do is take out the thousands of uh, potential inefficiencies and let's focus in on the ones that are going to net out the most savings. And that's what you're seeing over here. Uh, to further give you additional insights and recommendations, let's look at the optimize tab here. And here in this optimized tab, we can see instantly realizable savings. So node right sizing, no downsizing. That's actually what you just saw in my previous example. So we're showing at an enterprise level, hey, how much can we actually save overall if we did all of the downsizing and right sizing um, uh, recommendations? Now, just a heads up, this is my playground environment. So we like to keep costs down, but think about this on your workloads. Uh, where maybe you're running some very heavy jobs and you're maybe spending thousands, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, maybe millions uh, a month uh, on Databricks. Um, these savings start to, uh, you know, uh, start to add up. And, um, and this gives us a great way to see enterprise-wide across all of my workspaces. Hey, what are some of those first quick hits? What are those first wins that we can actually enact and actually net out some of those savings? Uh, the second panel here is code optimization. And here, what we wanted to really capture here is that further right-sizing uh, optimization 
um, can be done if you actually go even deeper to the code. So how is that SQL written? Is it efficient? How is that code actually playing out? Is it actually using all the resources or was everything running on the driver? Um, which happened, we happen to see a lot for a lot of those uh, data science work uh, workloads where maybe they're using pandas libraries that aren't using, uh, that uh, the libraries that they're using uh, don't have a concept of parallelization. So they just inherently just run on the driver itself. Uh, these are all things that we could actually optimize to even further reduce resource usage, which in turn means reduce cost. And so, you know, I'll click on one of these examples. So like, if we go back to the SQL insights here, we see inefficient join condition. If I go ahead and click on it and just pick on one of these, you can see here that we've uh, unravels detected on query 34. If I go and actually, uh, I can see the query plan here and I can get a little bit more additional details on this. And what it's telling me here is that you have a left table with lots of rows, right table with a lot of rows. And the output row actually has more than the max of the left and right. In fact, 1.53 more data. Now, what Unravel is recommending here is, hey, uh, you should think about filtering more of the rows here because normally you would expect joining the data is a filtering event. Uh, here, we're actually seeing more data. And so being able to call out this inefficiency and actually hint to the uh, developer who actually owns this code to apply some sort of filters uh, so we can actually reduce the amount of data that's being processed. Well, that will have an impact on how long the cluster runs or how long the job runs, and that should also reduce cost there. So uh, Unravel is not just about providing uh, configurations. It can go even deeper and look at the code itself, whether it is SQL that I'd shown here, whether it's Python or maybe it's it's uh, Java, Scala, whatever it may be. Unravel is going to be able to go there a little bit deeper and identify what line of code, what SQL statement is actually providing or causing that inefficiency and calling attention to it so we can further reduce cost from that perspective. Now, if I go back to the summary tab here, and I wanted to revisit this cost rating here, and more specifically, you can see that we've broken it down into four brackets. We have uncontrolled, we have poor, we have managed and optimized. You, can, you guys can read the screen, but if I were to net it out here, uh, uncontrolled rampant jobs that are being uh, uh, being run on your Databricks environment that you're paying for that have massive uh, over allocation of resources and uh, lots of uh, wasted spend going on things that um, you know could have been optimized uh, poor uh, a little bit better uh, and you want to be more in the managed and the optimized where uh, Unravel is, think about it is we're automatically looking at every single job cluster work on, on all of the workspaces and saying, yes, everything is as optimized. This is where we want to take organizations. So that way you have an automated approach to really understand where the areas of inefficiencies are and really start to define your plan of action to ensure that this very powerful data stack called Databricks is being used in a cost-effective, but uh, getting the performance that sh that you uh, expect from these uh, very uh, fast modern data platforms. So today's topic, again, right-sizing uh, your data infrastructure, optimizing Databricks cluster and workspace configurations. Uh, I hope that this gives you a good um, feel about how customers are doing this today using out-of-the-box tooling like system tables. Um, I showed you how you can use a purpose-built built, uh, data ops and FinOps observability platform like Unravel to really help upscale and really net out you know, all the optimizations um, in your environment. Um, and so thank you for your time. Uh, what I'm gonna do next here is uh, look at some of the questions that I see here. So the first one here is what metrics should I track within Databricks for efficiency? Um, so basically, um, what, hold on a second here, what, what metrics should I track within Databricks for efficiency? Let me think about this. Um, really it all comes down to, uh, identifying where the inefficiencies are. Um, uh, there is no one metric to track if you're using something like a system tables, because, uh, systems tables provides the ability for us to 
observe telemetry data, go ahead and create some of these things, but actually measure the impact um, from that perspective, you just don't get that. Uh, you do get that from an Unravel perspective. Um, and so uh, for folks that are looking to track efficiency, um, you know, we have those metrics out of the box. Uh, the next question here, how often should I adjust my clusters? Oh, that's a very popular question. Now, I do want to caveat this, that the way that Unravel works is we are learning, um, you know, patterns for from, from a workflow perspective. Um, so we do need to learn the seasonality of the data, uh, you know, the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows of your workloads, whether, uh, you know, whether these workloads end up actually having more uh, CPU requirements versus memory or vice versa. Um, we need to be able to see that so that way Unravel can go ahead and make those recommendations uh, to right size those workers. And then ultimately still take advantage of some of the uh, native features of Databricks like auto scaling. So there is a bit of a little bit of a learning that Unravel will need to be uh, do. And then from there, uh, taking those recommendations, applying it would be the next step. What is the most efficient way to manage my clusters? Well, the most efficient way to manage them would be to use Unravel. I'm a little bit biased, but uh, you know we've been in the trenches. Uh, we've worked with some of the largest Databricks customers that are out there. And the biggest common things that I see is uh, teams and organizations simply just do not have the time to spend on these mundane tasks of optimizing or troubleshooting why their pipelines are slow. Um, Unravel is purpose-built for this. So that way you as an organization can really uh, invest your engineering resources to create the best data products that you're looking to do and leave some of this mundane stuff to technology like Unravel. Uh, so that way, um, you know, we can really uh, up-level your productivity overall and uh, help you uh, uh, get the, uh, you know, the data products out to market as, fast, as quickly and as efficiently as possible. Um, I don't see any other questions here. Uh, happy to continue answering anything from um, from the chat. But uh, before I, I break, I do want to share one more thing. And that is that you can go today and now get your free Databricks health check simply by visiting this URL here. So unraveldata.com slash Databricks dash health dash check dash request. Um, go ahead, check it out. Go through those use cases that I've shown here before uh, previously, uh, as well as maybe check this out for some of the other existing or previous uh, sessions that I've done. Um, but um, but yes, you know it's it's free for you to check this out and uh, no cost to you to do this. So um, you know I definitely recommend you try out the product and see what life could be like uh, if you're using Unravel for your data ops and FinOps observability use cases. My name is Chris Santiago. Thanks again. And until next webinar, we will see you soon. Thank you.